Live from the Improv in Santa Monica, California, it's the Kellogg's Pop Tarts Comedy Video. Starring Paula Poundstone. Also starring Jeff Stilson. Anthony Griffith. Doug Kehoe. And Marty Putz. Brought to you by Kellogg's Pop Tarts. So hot, they're cool. Now here's Paula Poundstone. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for coming. Um, this, uh, you guys all know, this uh, videotape is going to be available with Pop-Tarts, box tops. So essentially we know right now we're talking to Pop-Tart eaters. It's a good feeling, isn't it? Just knowing that the Pop-Tart eaters are going to be, you know, they're going to be sitting at home eating tarts one day and doing that thing you do when you eat breakfast foods where you just stare at the back of the package anyways. And you realize, like, with all the things you could read, why are you reading this right now? I don't know, they'll read it maybe through each tart, so that's six times. But before they realize, I could eat two more boxes of these. I actually, in fact, you know what, you guys? I eat a box of Pop-Tarts every day, which is sort of how this came about, really. It's, not, it's a fact. And, uh, and I happened to mention it on stage before, and so colleagues asked me to do this, but... Uh, which I was happy to do, because in fact I do eat a box of tarts each day, and this is the reason, of course, you can see the package, the uh, tart snapped in half, so you can see the cross-section with all the rich, tasty goodness right there. <laughs> this, by the way, see the strawberries on the front of this box? This is just a serving suggestion. <laughs> don't be disappointed if you open your box and you don't find any loose fruit inside. That's just a way of how you could prepare them in your own home. Well, this is really what happens to me. There are um, six toaster pastries, yes, yes, but they come in pouches of two. <laughs> this is the trick, ladies and gentlemen. This is what happens to me. I open the first uh, package and I eat one tart and I enjoy it very much, as naturally you would. <laughs> and then I feel, well, I have to eat the second one or it will go stale. No, I figured, you know, I've, I've eaten two, it's no longer, it's a snack, it's a meal, I may as well eat two more. And then finally I'm just like, well, heck, I don't just want two Pop-Tarts hanging out in a box. <laughs> eat the last two just to tidy up, really. Actually, I'm, I'm, I swear, I'm not just, uh, I'm not just saying this, actually, they are a fine food, and I always find myself reading the ingredients on the side, you know, and it's really not bad, nine... Uh, no, here it is. Five grams of fat. I can handle that. That's not a problem. Right? <laughs> per serving. Oh, but serving one pastry. You're kidding me. What kind of idiot would just have one tart? <laughs> I met a guy who told me he likes to eat the chocolate-flavored, chocolate-frosted ones. He said he heats them up, breaks them up into a bowl, pulls milk over them, and eats them. I go, well, forget it. You might as well cook. You're using more than three steps. You're cooking, in my opinion. <laughs> I've, if you ever see me in an airport, I, I dare you to stop me. I, have a, I always have a box right in my carry-on bag so that when the um, stewardess comes around with the yucky snack cart and everybody else gets their little foil pouch of nuts, I lean into my bag and pull out a pop tart. <laughs> All the other passengers look at me bitterly. Where'd you get that? <laughs> How much you pay for this flight? <laughs> you guys seem like such a nice crowd. I'm almost kind of sorry the little Pop-Tart eaters can't be with us right now. <laughs> this is like putting a message in a bottle or something, you know? Kind of a good feeling. How's that one piece of hair doing? Is it in your way as much as it's in mine? Oh. Drives me nuts. Some days I can't even get out of bed. I just go, I cannot push that piece of hair out of my face one more time. <laughs> Too much energy for me. I just had dinner, which is the stupidest thing, because I, had, I eat constantly. I've never known anyone who eats as much as I. I, I am constantly hungry. I don't ever recall feeling full. 
that's a fact. So, to be honest with you, I wouldn't even mind being a huge fat pig if it just felt full. <laughs> At this point, I'm just exhausted by the search for food. I don't even, in fact, I don't keep food in my refrigerator in my house because I know that the problem is I've been hungry for something for the longest time and I don't know what it is. That seems to be the problem. You know, for 31 years I've been hungry for something like a jelly donut, but it is not a jelly donut. And I know that it's probably something like deep down there's an emptiness, a loneliness, a lack of life fulfillment, something like that really, but it sure does feel like a jelly donut. That's why I don't keep food in my house. I know I would find myself at midnight eating my way through the refrigerator looking for what I was hungry for. You know, going, nope. It was not a giant cheese ball that I needed. Well, I couldn't be sure until I completed it. Did you know that in Madison, Wisconsin, this last summer, there was a uh, big fire at a government food building? Did anybody else hear about this? It was national news. Um, big fire in a government food building and it caused all the cheese and butter to melt and rush out of the building. So they had a big cheese butter river and it was going right for their waterways. It was a big deal in Madison because they thought that they were going to have cholesterol in their waterways. You know, of all the accidents that could happen, I know it's a bad thing and everything, but it struck me as sort of funny somehow. I don't even know what emergency crew you call out for a cheese butter river. I picture like a fire truck with huge crackers just, come on! Go fondue sticks. <laughs> now, I was in Canada last summer. Did you know that in Canada they get eight Pop Tarts in a box, regular? I don't know what. I feel the exact same way. You know, I've always been jealous of Canada. I was never sure why. As it turns out, it was Tart Envy the entire time. I was working in Canada, the, the Canadian audience told me they thought that we won't use the metric system here because we're stubborn. I go, no, we're stupid, we've tried, we can't. <laughs> Why would they mock us that way? <laughs> Sir, did you have your glasses off? Did you? Was it, I can never tell when people I'm doing, like working and somebody takes their glasses off, I can never tell. Was it because you could see me or because you couldn't? <laughs> Well, you just get to a point where you just didn't enjoy the show anymore? Nah. Maybe elbow your wife. Honey, take your glasses off. She's better fuzzy. She's one of the better fuzzy comics I've ever seen. Oh, because I brought tears to your eyes? Oh. I think... I think he's Canadian. When I mentioned that they have eight tarts, he was kind of lonely for the homeland. <laughs> Sir, what, what do you do for a living? Nothing. You don't do anything? How's that going for you? <laughs> Did you ever get sick of that and just punch off the clock and do something? <laughs> Must be exhausting. <laughs> oh, he, he has a wife to support him? I didn't even realize. You know, sir, this video will be available to children through box tops. Do you think that's the kind of image we want to tell them that adults have? Some kid's going to be eating a tart, reading a box, go, I could do nothing. I just don't think it's healthy at all. Um, actually, you know what, I watch, uh, I watch tapes with my cats. One time my cats heard my voice coming through the speakers in my house and they absolutely flipped out. It was kind of a weird experience for them. I, I have five cats and they're really great, actually. Although one area they're no help with whatsoever, that's security. You know, a lot of t I just moved into a house about six months ago and I'm usually too nervous, uh, kind of afraid of crime and stuff, so I'm often too nervous to even stay there. But every now and then I do stay there. And you know, all five of my cats sleep with me, I'll be just about to doze off to sleep when for no apparent reason they all five just stop and stare out the bedroom door. <laughs> oh fine, I guess I'll just lay awake bathed in sweat for another night. <laughs> you know what it actually was helpful? When we lived in the apartment, I could never hear the doorbell from my bedroom. 
The only reason I ever knew the doorbell rang was because all five of my cats would run into my room completely puffed up. <laughs> it's just like in a big panic. And you know, they never, ever, ever, ever put it together that there would be that particular noise and I would open the door and there was a person there. They never connected those two things. They were always happy to see the person. They'd be like, come in quickly, we heard a noise. <laughs> big babies. Did you guys just have like big spillage or something? I heard like, the, I heard like things dropping, what happened? I tried to be cool about it, but suddenly I couldn't. What, what spilled, ma'am? Oh, your eyes? Oh, let's just go. <laughs> that lady spilled her eyes. I don't even want to be here anymore. How did you spill your eyes? Was something rambunctious happened? Oh, she knocked it out. Oh, fine, a little finger pointing. Maybe we'll just have to separate the two of you for the rest of the show. Maybe you'll be out in the hall, young lady, and you can get the notes from a neighbor. Remember when they used to say that in school, you have to get the notes from a neighbor? I kept knocking on some old guy's house next door. I go, yeah, she said you'd have the math. I thought it was odd myself. You know, I, uh, most of the stuff I learned in high school has not been all that helpful to me, in terms of academics, in terms of academics, I wouldn't say the whole experience, but has not been all that helpful to me in adult life. Have you found that? History, exa history, exactly. <laughs> At what point in conversation do you turn to somebody and go, geez, guess uh, Lincoln's dead, huh? <laughs> yep, I heard they cut the guy. <laughs> a lot of histories lies anyways, you know, I mean, heck, they lie about stuff that happened just a few minutes ago on the news. I can hardly believe they haven't perhaps obscured the facts from hundreds of thousands of years ago. I remember in elementary school being told Columbus discovered America. And then the exact same teacher said, well, some Indians were already there and some Vikings had already come and gone. <laughs> so I said, well, then he didn't discover it. And the teacher said, no, 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 Paul, he discovered it for Spain. <laughs> oh, for Spain. Can you do that? <laughs> I'm glad he's dead. I don't want to come home some night, find Columbus coming in through my living room window. He'd be like, uh, am I the first one here? Well, no. No, I live here. No, 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 no. Am I the first one here for Spain? Well, then come on in. Let me show you what to do with corn. I came home the other night. I came home the other night, and five, all five of my cats were standing in a semicircle around the living room wall. And I knew what they were doing the moment I came in. They had found a beetle bug. And they were taking turns whacking it. <laughs> Apparently it would flail on its back for a while and then it would flip over. And then one of them would... <laughs> My cats hate each other. They've never stood that close to one another. But apparently the, the desire to torment something smaller than them drew them together. <laughs> Not unlike people, really, when you think about it. I, I felt so bad for the bug when I came in. I took, I threw it out the window, you know? And you know they all still just stood there staring at it. Like it, right at where it had been. I felt like a cop, go, okay, break it up. The show's over. The beetle bug's gone. Go back to your area. That was a big deal to them because they don't, they don't go out, you know? They're into a cat, so it's to see like a little form of life and now it was a big thrill for them, you know? It's like cat folklore now, you know? Probably right now they're laying all fat and lazy near their water bowls going, remember that beetle bug? Well, we beat the stuffing out of that beetle bug, didn't we? <laughs> well, you guys ready to get going? Yeah! Good thing. Well, I'm excited to introduce to you your first act. We actually, you know what, you guys? I got to tell you, I'm I'm astounded. Uh, that they really put together actually a great show. I'm like the pickiest person in the entire world, and we have really funny, great people here for you tonight, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. The first guy I'd like to introduce to you, please welcome Jeff Stilson.
thank you very much, folks. Nice to uh, be back out west again. I, uh, I used to live in Seattle, Washington. Yeah, I moved to New York a couple of years ago. I left a city that has a high suicide rate for one that has a high homicide rate. Uh, guess I'm just not a do-it-yourself kind of person. I was, uh, I was born and raised in Spokane, Washington. A oh, Spokane is a smaller city. Actually, it's more of a town. Uh, the zoo in Spokane was recently named the worst zoo in the United States by USA Today. It is pretty bad, too. Most of the animals in the zoo are native to the Spokane area. They just happen to be on the grounds when the zoo was built. Um, The airport in Spokane is called the Spokane International Airport, even though there are no international flights. We got the idea from the International House of Pancakes. We figured it would add an air of sophistication to the region. I, uh, I just moved into a new apartment in New York. That's a hassle. I'm still furnishing it. The other day I bought a cutting board from my kitchen. It's a piece of wood with a handle on it. It's made in Yugoslavia. Apparently, we don't have the technology in this country to make a cutting board. I, uh, I live alone. I'm not married. I hope to be someday, though, just so I can stop exercising. Um, I don't understand these couples who get married and then continue to work out and eat healthily. I mean, what's the point of getting married if you can't let yourself go? It's not as if you have to be attractive anymore. The race is over. Take off the uniform. I'm not good at flirting with women. All I know is that I'm supposed to make eye contact, you know, which is easy, but for how long? I mean, a fine line separates eye contact from the piercing stare of a psychopath. I want to look confident, not maniacal. I, uh, I don't enjoy dating anymore. It takes too much time and effort. You know, you have to make that phone call, maybe send flowers, go to dinner, catch a movie. It'd be so much easier if we could just swim upstream or make a loud clacking noise. <laughs> it's a wearisome process searching for a mate. I mean, after a while, you can't help but lose some of your enthusiasm, you know? Dating is like gathering fruit. When you first start out, you pick only the best apples, but by the end of the day, you're throwing anything into your basket. <laughs> See, proposing marriage would unnerve me. Again, I'd be very vulnerable. I, uh, I wouldn't want to buy an engagement ring. I have poor taste in jewelry. I'd rather just hand the woman the money. Here, will you marry me? No? How much more? I'd also favor a short engagement, you know. Some, some couples get engaged and then they don't set a date. They're just engaged for an indefinite period of time. That doesn't make sense. It's like going to the supermarket, filling up your grocery cart, and then just walking around. Can I ring that up for you? Uh, no, that's all right. Maybe next summer. Well, I have learned one thing through the years. It's best not to joust with a woman verbally. Women have a better grasp of the language than men. There are no synonyms in a woman's vocabulary. Every word has its own shade of meaning. I didn't say I was mad. I said I was upset. <laughs> Maybe you should listen. <laughs> Women are much more verbal than men. That's why whenever you see an elderly couple together, it's always the old man who has the hearing aid. <laughs> We aren't verbal. Men are analytical. That's why we're rarely able to provide women with the romantic dialogue they so desire. Women should have teleprompters mounted on their foreheads. <laughs> that way we could read whatever they wanted us to say and still almost make eye contact and appear sincere. Without you, my life has no meaning. I am like a bee with her. Je I'm sorry, I don't speak French. I don't speak French. I wish I did. French is the language of love. I speak German. That was my minor in college, German language. I spent one year studying in Vienna, Austria. I didn't, I didn't acclimate well overseas. Little things threw me, like speaking German to dogs. Calm. 
Ja, du bist ein guter Hund. I felt as though they were looking at me like, God, you have the worst accent. <laughs> So you aren't taught in a classroom what you really need to know, like how to swear in German. You know, if I got cut off in traffic in Vienna, the vilest thing I could scream was the equivalent to, go away, you big bad man. I've always found the study of language interesting. I had a linguistics professor who said that it's man's ability to use language that makes him the dominant species on the planet. I'm not sure if I agree with that. I think what sets us apart from other animals is that we aren't afraid of vacuum cleaners. <laughs> we can actually operate one. I started studying German in high school. I, uh, I was very active in the German club. We were a small organization. That is, until we annex the French club. Yeah. I, was also very, I was also very active in sports in high school. I went out for the wrestling team. Uh, that was a huge mistake. I had the wrong idea about high school wrestling. I thought it was like professional wrestling. Showed up at the first practice wearing a cape and elves slippers. Uh, coach made me run laps. I also tried boxing when I was younger. I didn't, I didn't have much success in the ring. I was uh, gun shy from having an older brother. Every time my opponent hit me, I would tell the referee. <laughs> my brother beat me up almost every day. He never got in trouble either unless he hit me in the back. My parents considered that cowardly. That's an odd message to convey to a child, isn't it? Don't hit your brother unless you can nail him in the face. <laughs> One time he beat me up so badly that I wet my pants. Not because I was scared, I just wanted him to get off of me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I feel sorry for the commentators in bowling. You know, the sport is so predictable. There's just a ball and an alley. There's no defense, no obstacles, no strategy. So, Jim, what do you think he'll do on this one? He's probably going to try to knock those pins down. Back to you. Not much of an athlete. Uh, never been much of a sportsman either. My father and I uh, hunted just once when I was 12. We, uh, we took our dog with us, a basset hound named Lancelot. We assumed that he would help us. We were wrong. He got lost. Spent the whole day looking for him. It was kind of like hunting. We wore boots and stalked an animal. We just didn't kill it when we found it. And spanked it with a newspaper. It's hard to do that with deer. I've always been a big animal lover. At present, I share my apartment with a cat who, uh, who weighs 15 pounds. My goal is 25 pounds. <laughs> then I want to enter him in the state fair. A couple weeks ago, I had to take him to the vet. He had been limping. Vet says that he has a bad knee. I didn't even know cats had knees. <laughs> they might not. I know nothing about the feline anatomy. If the vet told me the cat needed new batteries, I couldn't argue. <laughs> anyway, the vet instructed me to make sure that the cat took it easy the next few days. Yeah, I guess that means his usual 20 hours of sleep per day wouldn't promote the healing process. If the cat takes it any easier, might as well have him stuffed. Anyway, thank you very much. Jeff Stilson, ladies and gentlemen. They, you know, when you go to the grocery store and they get those, uh, they get, they, they get those magazines right up near the register, which I always kind of, I wish they would move those things, you know? You know, the Inquirer and People Magazine, stuff like that. I never actually touch them, you know? But I can't, I can't help but read the covers. You know, I'm standing right there. You can't help it. It's right there before you. 
And half the time, like, it, it, I never have received this news before. It's some story I didn't even hear about, you know. A lot of times, uh, it's traumatic. I got people behind me waiting in line. I, I got the cashier there and some food on the car. I can't just burst into tears and run out. <laughs> I was there one time when they had the Oprah Will Never Die It Again one. I was so upset by it, you know. I said, I said to the cashier, I just found out about Oprah. Could I, I put some of this food back? <laughs> I don't even feel like partying now. I said, I may as well put the cat food back. They're not going to want to eat when they hear. My cats and Oprah have always been kind of close. <laughs> you know, naturally. Dun, 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 dun. All right, you guys, this next act, you're really going to enjoy him because he's very, very funny. Please welcome Anthony Griffith. Thank you. Thank you very much. Glad to be back here in California. Yeah. Good. I moved out here about a year and a half ago from Chicago, came out here to pursue my acting career. And it amazes me how many people in L.A. think they're in the entertainment business, you know. You can walk into McDonald's and the first thing they'll tell you is, I'm working at McDonald's but I'm really a choreographer slash producer. You know? <laughs> okay, well, why don't you dance over there and produce me a cheeseburger? You know? But I moved out here with my, with my wife. I've been married now for five years, which I enjoy. You know, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. I'll be honest, though, I almost didn't marry my wife because my wife would always walk into things while we were dating, you know, because she's nearsighted, which I never knew at the time because she never wore her glasses around me. And I saw my wife walk into a brick wall once, you know, and I mean hard. I thought a car had backfired. That's how hard she walked into that wall, you know. And she still refused to tell me she had an eye problem, even when she regained consciousness, you know? I'm like, baby, you okay? Yeah, why you say that? Because you just walked into that building. I didn't see it. You didn't see the building? Exactly what part of the building didn't you see? I didn't see the building. Are you calling me a lie? No. no, I'm not calling you a lie. If you didn't see the building, you didn't see the building. In fact, now that I take a good look at the building, I can see how you missed it, you know? Because it is a foggy day, you know? In fact, when I woke up this morning and saw just how foggy it was, the first thing I said to myself was, man, I hope I don't walk into a building here. You know? See, I think that's the secret to a happy marriage, you know, communication. People don't communicate like they used to. I read an article where this man married this lady and discovered she had 125 personalities and not one of them could cook. You know? That's great, man. And I think whomever you're thinking about marriage, you know, you should get to know their sleeping habits first. Because people have strange sleeping habits. Like my wife snores a lot. You ever sleep with someone that snores so bad that they wake their own self up? You know? <laughs> They're just in bed going... Try to blame it on you. Come on, keep it on. Keep it on. In the meantime, straight dogs are by the window. Oh. oh. And if there's one tip I would give any young man thinking of marriage in the future, when it's time to buy the rings, whatever you do, go alone. You take your fiance, I guarantee you, not even Disneyland will have anything that compares to the ride you'll be going on that day. You know? It's true, man. Because women shop for the biggest rings possible. Well, that's nice, but I was looking for something more crystal ballish. You know. <laughs> Me and no, we go along, we'll look at anything that's on sale. Uh, yeah, Alex, the ring on display for twelve ninety nine, please. <laughs> and I heard there's a discount if I mention Kellogg's Pop Tart. Yeah. Yeah. And once a man gets married, the biggest responsibility he will ever face is that he must protect his spouse no matter what the cost. Someone tries to stick up your lady fellas, you must shield her with your body. And women understand we men have no problems with that. The problem arises with the fact that you women knowing this, you have the tendency to instigate the holdup. You know? So while your man is shielding you, you behind him yelling, that's right. If you want my purse, you have to blow his head off. And I don't think you can do it. 
In fact, I dare you to do it. <laughs> Next thing you know, the police have the scene of the crime. Excuse me, ma'am. Can you explain to me what made this thief empty his magnum into your husband's chest? I'm not quite clear on that. Why did he feel compelled to empty every chamber in his gun, reload, then do it again? I don't understand that. And looking at your husband's face, neither did he. No. Oh, oh, I don't know. We were just talking. Then he just freaked out. Oh, I'm so alone. Guess I'll just take the insurance money and move to the Bahamas. What can happen, man? It is crazy, man. I did a lot of things besides perform while I was in college, you know. I played a little basketball, very little. I was known as a minute man. Coach, can I play now? In a minute man. In a minute. In a minute. My favorite sport, though, is boxing. I love boxing, man. Especially Mike Tyson. That's a rough brother. Because I saw one of Tyson fights where he literally hit this man so hard the blood shot on my face. And I'm watching the fight in my living room. He beat this man to the point that after the bout, when the loser was asked what his future plans were, all he could say was, where, where as far as I'm concerned, Mike Tyson, the greatest fighter of all time. But hey, you know, don't count me out. I'm going to be back. I'm going to just take the next year and a half to basically concentrate on uh, breathing. <laughs> and then hopefully with the help of my trainer, we can pursue other matters such as finding out who am I? And which evil spirit possessed me getting to the ring with that man? <laughs> and Tyson's voice is so soft, isn't it? To me, Tyson talks like Tweety Bird, you know? I'm a professional fighter, you know? He think I'm sick, they think I'm mad depressed, you know? Constantly. I think I saw a pussy cat. <laughs> That's how he sets up his fights, because the average boxer would listen to Michael and talk and say to himself, oh man, I can beat that brother. And then step in the ring with him, and before you know it, they're in the hospital going, I'm a little teapot, short ass. <laughs> but I had to adjust financially to live out here, man, because it's so expensive out here, man. I went shopping for some gym shoes the other day. Every brand cost over $100. And you see kids just begging their parents, Oh, Mama, they're Ed Joyce. I want the Ed Joyce. I want to be like Michael. You know, well, until you bring home $3 million like Michael, I'm taking you to pay less. You know? That's how my father was, man. We couldn't afford anything when I was growing up because my father always had bill collectors after him. You know? My father had so many bill collectors after him, when they came to our house, they carpooled. You know? And I felt sorry for my younger brother because he was always wearing my hand-me-downs, you know. He never had anything he could call his own. Even his childhood pictures were old pictures of me. You know? <laughs> my father would say things like, Danny, this is you in eighth grade. I'm not in eighth grade yet. Well, this is what you're going to look like in eighth grade. <laughs> and take a good look because these are the clothes you'll be wearing. <laughs> and the reason we never had money is because what little we had, my father always spent it on our dog. That's why I hate dogs to this day. We had a fire in our house once, and our dog was the first one out the house. In fact, I didn't know there was a fire until he called me up on the payphone across the street. You know? I'm running outside my underwear. Hey, man, how come you didn't bark? Hey, you got a smoke detector. I heard it. And you have people here that dress their dogs? That's what I understand, man. One of the most embarrassing moments in my life was one day on my way to work, a dog crossed my path wearing a sweater and a matching cap. And I just so happened to be wearing that same outfit. You know. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. So how have you been? I was gone for a few minutes. I kind of missed you. How you doing? Just gone for a couple minutes, were you? Could happen to anybody, ma'am. Oh, she doesn't know what we're talking about, does she? 
Ma'am, what, what do you do for a living? You're enrolling in chef training? Is that why you're here tonight? You just, you just told, you just toast him for about a minute, ma'am. What is this? Is this some kind of extra credit project or something you're doing here? You just toast them for a minute and slather them in butter, ma'am. That's it. <laughs> you guys are really going to have a great time with this next act because he's very, very funny and actually happens to be a very good friend of mine as well. Please welcome Doug Keel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paula. I should explain something right at the beginning here, because I think it's very important that you people know this about me. I'm an idiot. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Oh, hold your applause. I used to say I'm a stupid idiot, but then a friend of mine said, uh, that's redundant. I said, oh yeah, what's that mean? He said, don't worry about it, man. Yeah, you're a stupid idiot. I said, thank you. I used to ask if there were other idiots in a room, because I don't like to be the only one. But any time I would ask that question, people would start pointing to other people at the table. Uh, hey, I'm fine, but I'm sitting next to an idiot. Well, why are you doing that? I like to watch the things he does. Well, idiots can be very entertaining. Sometimes I'd ask this question, about 10 minutes later, somebody in the back of the room would go, over here, man, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Go, hey, don't worry about it, you're an idiot. <laughs> Actually, I always know there's going to be some idiots in a room. I mean, it stands to reason. Did you know that, statistically speaking, 14% of the world are idiots? 14%. So you've got 100 people in a room, that's 10, 11 idiots right there. Yeah. <laughs> easily. Some people are thinking, oh boy, a math joke. Other people are thinking, wouldn't it be more like eight or nine? <laughs> people like me are thinking, what's a percentage? I'll tell you something, I'm accepting the fact that I'm an idiot a whole lot better lately because I've started going to Idiots Anonymous, which is just great. Now I stand in front of a group of people, I say, hi, I'm Doug, I'm an idiot. And they say, hi, Bob. <laughs> and I feel so comfortable with those folks. Some of you people are probably thinking, I would love to play along with all this, but I am not so sure if I'm an idiot or not. And don't worry about that, because it's not easy to judge yourself that way. But we can do a little test up here, and hopefully halfway through the test, you'll say, hey, I'm an idiot, thanks. <laughs> the true test of being an idiot is not whether you do stupid things, it's whether you try to cover up for the dumb things that you do. You know, let's face it, once you start taking time out of your day to, to cover up for yourself, you're an idiot. Good example, you ever come out of your house in the morning on your way to work, or on your way to school, or on your way to France, wherever? As you're walking towards your car, you realize that you forgot something in the house. If you're really stupid, your clothes, something like that. Oh, for goodness sakes, I'm naked. So you pull one of these numbers, you walk out to the car. As you realize you've forgotten something, you go, and you walk back into the house, right? Now, do you know why you go like this? You think you'd look like an idiot if you went like this. Your neighbors would be out there going, there he goes again, Margaret, look at that boy. That boy's an idiot. Keep him away from our daughter. He is thick as a post. There's been talk of animals up here. And I'll tell you, animals, they're usually not idiots. And that's because they live such a, a non-complicated life. Animals are very, very basic, and it seems to be working for them. They do not have the emotional problems that we do. I mean, rarely do you see a dog sitting on a curb with his head in his paws, crying his eyes out. I don't know how to be a happy dog anymore. Another dog walks over and says, here's a book I've been reading. Maybe it'll help you. I like to use the expressions of animals quite often. I'll teach you a game that any of you could play. You could start playing it tonight. I call it recreational barking. All you need is a grocery store, fairly good sized grocery store. It has to be open 24 hours. I'll go there about 3 o'clock in the morning. It's dead quiet in the store at that time. So quiet you can hear a dog bark. Do you know what I mean? I'll go way to the back of the store. I'll wait for the coast to be clear, which isn't too tough at 3 o'clock in the morning. If there is someone back there, I'll say, hey, you want to get out of the way? I'm going to do some barking. Shh, they're gone. Which is very convenient, because they leave their groceries. I say, That's all the stuff I needed, right there in that cart. I'll get back there, I'll take a couple deep breaths, I'll go, arr, arr, arr. clerks come running with brooms looking for that dog. I go, he's a big old dog. He went right around the corner and down that aisle. They run that way, I run to another part of the store, start barking again, and the game has begun. And I run and bark, and they chase. It's up and down the aisles for like 20, 30 minutes till they finally catch up to me. And I'll tell you, when they do, they're never having as good a time as I am. <laughs> I'm having a ball here, folks, and they are ticked. 
<laughs> Sometimes I think, I think that it's not that I'm an idiot, it's just that I'm confused. Honestly, I mean, I'll find myself confused so often some days. I'll be walking down the street, I'll just stop, and I'll think, I have no idea what's going on. Do you ever get that way? I feel like the whole world is completely beyond my understanding. Sometimes I get so confused, I'll be walking down the street, I almost panic. I just want to stop somebody and say, hey, man, do you know what's going on? But I never do that, because I'm just terrified. The guy will say, yes, I do, but I'm not supposed to tell you. <laughs> that would be very bad. For a long, long time, I thought I was confused because I'm an only child. And my sister said, God, you're an idiot. How could you possibly be this stupid? I'm sorry. Confusion comes from the family. There's no doubt about it. If you're confused, chances are your parents were confused, your grandparents were confused, and so on and so on and scooby dooby doo My father used to confuse and frighten me with poetry when I was a little kid. People are thinking, boy, there's an abuse you don't often hear of, poetry abuse. My dad is a little Irishman. I don't know where he got these poems or why he would spring them on me. I would be minding my own business. My father would walk in the living room and say things to me like, Hey, Doug, the boy stood on the burning deck and his feet were full of blisters. He tore his pants on a rusty nail and now he wears his sisters. <laughs> the hell are you talking about? <laughs> I'm going to go outside till I'm 18. <laughs> things like Halloween were confusing. My goodness sakes. I was five years old the first time Halloween came by that I can remember. I had never heard of Halloween before in my life. I think it's a normal evening. I eat my dinner, finish all my vegetables, because I'm a good little kid. After dinner, for no apparent reason at all that I could see, my parents take me into the back bedroom, dress me up to look like a chicken. I'm thinking, this is cause for alarm. I have full feathers and a beak. My father shoves a bag under my wing, says, go get candy from the neighbors. I'm thinking, they're going to jail for this. Yeah. This has got to be against the law, even in California. Yeah. And it's not like they needed candy. They had a whole bowl of candy sitting right by the front door. Yeah. They had more candy than they'd ever had in that house. End of the evening, I'm saying, I'll tell you what, how about the two of you wait here and I go get a cop, all right? <laughs> Something wrong with this house, and I think you're in on it. The things we heard as kids. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. He was an egg, for God's sakes. How are you going to put an egg back together again? They're asking horses to do it. What sort of managerial decision was that? Uh, we're having no luck here, sir. All right, get out of the way, man. Get all the horses over here. Come on. All the king's horses. Give them a shot. Horses have to be sitting there thinking, this is stupid. We don't even have thumbs, man. This is a hook, you idiot. That's an egg. I want to see the union rep immediately. Remember this one? You bad little kittens, you've lost your mittens. Now you shall have no pie. Hey, there's a hell of a threat to a cat, huh? No pie, there's gonna be a riot in cat town tonight. Certainly things are getting towards. Why are you guys so upset? They took our pie away from us, man. Oh, what could they have been thinking? Cats don't eat pie? I'll tell you something though, cat food might as well be pie for the flavors you see in the stores and the commercials on TV. There's one commercial that drives me nuts. Flavors that cats naturally crave, like beef, liver, chicken. How does a cat naturally crave beef? <laughs> I'm a confessed idiot, and I know that's wrong. You know, cats don't naturally crave beef. If it's going to be flavors that cats naturally crave, it should be things like mouse, sparrow, housefly, moth, summertime flavors like crickets and lizards. But beef? When is the last time anybody in this room saw a cat ripping across a field and taking down a cow? Right? Boom. Man. You'd be out there going, my God, that was violent. Now, yes, but it's part of nature. You see, the cat naturally craves the cow and is therefore designed to take it down like that. And it's a good thing they don't, because if they did, you'd open the door on Sunday morning to get the paper. There'd be the cat out there, a big cow in its mouth, going, oh, God, it brought home another cow. Get the barbecue quick. Thank you guys very much. Good night.
keep talking about cats and animals. I don't think any one of us have children. You guys have children? Yeah. I know someone who has children. That's the closest I can come. I have a friend who just had a baby, wanted to know what I thought of the name Sophia. I go, ew. <laughs> Do you want it to have any friends at all? Why not just name her Hey There Lonely Girl? I think it's a lovely name for a grown woman, even a young girl, but there's something about a teeny tiny baby with the name so... Unless it's born with like a feather boa around its neck. It just doesn't make any... And you know what? Speaking of which, you know what I like that people do to their babies, girls now? They do that thing. They put that thing on their head. You know what I'm talking about? It's not a hat. It doesn't comfort the baby or protect... Exactly. It, it looks like a first prize pig thing from a county fair. Why would you strap in your baby's head? Their heads grow so fast, you could possibly impede the growth of the baby's head. I was on a flight the other day, and uh, I got on the plane, and there was a little curly-headed girl, about two years old probably, across the aisle from me, screaming, crying about something. And I thought, well, she's upset, and she'll get over it, and then we'll have a lovely flight. And then I heard the mother say, Ashley, honey, mommy doesn't like that. And I realized we were in for a terrible flight. My feeling is that Ashley's and Courtney's should not be allowed to fly. I don't know why that is. There is something about the parents who name their children Ashley and Courtney where they never get around to telling them no. And this was like the kind of parent that tries to reason with the child, you know, Ashley, honey, mommy isn't enjoying, Ashley, honey, mommy doesn't, Ashley, honey, mommy would rather you not, Ashley. I thought, doesn't Ashley fit in the overhead compartment? If she doesn't, check her. <laughs> you guys, this next act you're really going to enjoy because you're very, very funny. Please welcome Marty Putz. I'd like to start off with a quick movie impression for you. <laughs> Keep it up, pal. Keep it up. Where are you? Jeez. What's that? I missed? No problem. But right now, we're going to get to this sooner or later. Right now, it's time for a quick movie impression. My impression of my favorite Alfred Hitchcock movie. It's the coolest. Where do you see this? It was psycho. This is the best, though, at Christmas time when the shopping malls are really crowded. I love to come running out of pet shops wearing this. <laughs> but wait, gang, growing up as a little guy, my mom always used to bug me, so I always used to try and do a few things to get even with her. This is one of my favorites. This is the coolest, you guys. Where do you see this? Check this out. <laughs> Look, whenever she was ironing, I used to sneak up behind her. When she wasn't looking, I'd grab the iron and do this. <laughs> Check this out, look. Whenever she was vacuuming, I used to sneak up behind her, grab the vacuum, and do this. This is the coolest, watch this.
Shut up. All right. Cool. Snack time. Anybody hungry? Yeah. All right, cool. Whatever you do, when you get a marshmallow, don't eat it. Hang on to it. Right there, pal. All right. Good grab. Try that one. All right, back there. Young lady. Oh, nice snag. All right. Back there. Back there. Good grab. All right, right there. All right, over here, sir. Right here. Okay, back there. All right. All right. All right, where? where, where? All right, wait here. Okay, okay, wait, 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 all right. Right, right here, pal, right there, all right. Let's go, let's go over there, sir. Oh, geez, take two, fat boy. All right, hang on. All right. Gang, everyone, wait, this is the coolest. You guys, check this out. Sir, don't move, you're in the perfect seat. Look straight ahead. Don't move. This is the coolest. Don't move. Check this out, this will be so much fun. Right. This is so cool. All right. Hold still. Don't move. All right, everyone who has a marshmallow, hold it up, gang. Hold it up. This is the coolest because right now it's time for a game of Human Baseball! <laughs> well, and, oh! Thank you. By the way, gang, before you throw it, none of this with it, okay? We're going for a grab. All right, who's... All right, the young lady... Wait, wait. Do you need a bigger target, pal? We gotta get... All right, sure. Come on, we gotta... Yeah, 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 not bad. All right. Oh, cool. Cool. Now we're going for a spin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean that, honest. All right, it's up to you, buddy. One, two, three. <sighs> you meant that, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Sure, buddy. Right. Real funny. Let's see how you like it. Check this out, you guys. Where do you see this? In school with our lunch bags, we used to do puppet shows. Did you ever do this? I'd be working on some... Yeah, remember this? This is the coolest. I'd be working on a ventriloquist that... Ooh, gross. There's a roach. Ooh, I'll get it. Check this out. Check this out, you guys. I've got the world's only trained flea circus. <laughs> Watch this. You're about to see this flea go up this ladder, across this board, and land safely inside the cesspool. All right. Watch. Don't you hate when people do this? Ask me a question, anything you want. Go ahead, just ask me. What's your name? My name's Marty. <laughs> All right. Watch. Freddy. All right. Watch, you guys. It's the coolest. I like that myself. Hey, this is kind of neat. How many times have you been late for a date and had to get ready in a matter of moments? Never, ever. <laughs> yeah. Never. I look perfect. Check this out. I've got this, the coolest invention. First, you just kind of step right out of the shower and you slap this baby on it. Check this out. It's my new portable putt style o <laughs> Shut up, you guys. Slap her on, start her up. In a matter of five, four, three, two, one seconds, you're ready for your date. <laughs> oh, 
Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Right now, me and my boys in the band is going to do a little tune for you. It, it goes something like this. Hit it, boys! I'm feeling good right now, baby. All right. Got to do a little number four. First, I need me a little snack. Check this out. All right. All right, now we're going to do a little number four, sir. All right, thank you very much. Keep your feet, baby. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.